So um, officially welcoming everybody to CMX office hours. This is our opportunity to ask community related questions to community professionals. We started this in October last year. Um, there were a bunch of questions that Claire and I saw on uh, the CMX channels and I said, hey, why don't we uh, have office hours, opportunity to brainstorm with people who've been there, done that, and for, for newer people to come in and ask their questions. So uh, we've done this once a month, usually every Wednesday, every first or second Wednesday with Claire of Coursera. Welcome, Regina. Walton, I finally see the face behind the name. <laughs> Um, and so today we have our panelists, Linda, Michael, and Andy, and uh, our topic for today is part two of tools, software tools for community building. Um, last June, we talked about community platforms like the container, the software platform that people use as a container for their communities. And today we're going to talk about other tools that people use to grow the community and to build engagement. Right, Claire? Yeah, that's right. All, all sort of peripheral tools that you might use to support the community that isn't that main platform. So can you give examples of what other tools we might talk about today that you can think of? Yeah, um, and actually I would love to, to ask everybody like just simply what, what tools they use. Um, my list is, is actually very short and boring. Um, we use Google Analytics um and we use looker which is sort of not different from google analytics and our platform but it, it's it's another way of viewing our data um and then oh i know some people consider like um google suite right so we use google sheets google docs that kind of thing i always sort of forget that because it seems a bit obvious and, and way broader than obviously just community um and I will post in the chat if I think of any more, but I have a very short list. Cool, and since we have a small group, uh, feel free to chime in anytime if you have any questions. Um, this is your opportunity to ask those hard questions. Uh, we're fellow community professionals, so let's kind of help each other out. So what, what tools do you use, Linda, Michael, and Andy? We'll start with our panelists. And uh, what tools do you recommend? I go first. Uh, so I've used like a lot of uh, baby for virtual events, especially for um, this kind of uh, Q and A uh, sessions. Uh, lately, um, I also have used like Meetup for local events when they were like I think, and I hope soon again. Um, so lately, I discovered another tool uh, called like Circles. I think it's called Circles. And um, it's great for small uh, community groups to break it like in small groups with, with community uh, members to have um, more like uh, conversations and understanding the need and creating such like a, um, a small impact group uh, with members to get to get to know them better to have um, more personal conversations and also you know, uh, explore them and um, and basically uh, create this engagement this feeling that is missing with the big communities um, because when it's like crowded when it's packed uh, people tend to lose the feeling of belonging because they don't feel heard enough so with this tool, I feel like uh, I can bring like small groups together and uh, be in the among friends and uh, hear everybody and uh, talk to everyone. Uh, and it's, it's great. It, it, it works uh, perfectly for uh, our needs. Um, and I've used also um, another tool called Airtime, just briefly, uh, for sharing videos on uh, um, like from the like digital uh, teams, like this, uh, watching a video together and commenting in real time. So the first tool you said was circles. It's circles. I will gonna post, uh, paste the. Um, I, I yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Linda. Michael. 
Uh, so kind of like Claire, I have a very short list. Um, philosophically, I don't like automating community engagement. I know there's a lot of tools out there to like automatically email people to try and re-engage them or, you know, an, an automated process to onboard them. Um, and to me, that's just like, that's the opposite of what community is about. It's really about people connecting to each other and talking to each other. So I stay away from the automated tools, but I do need tools to give me observability into my community. Who's who, what are they doing? Who are they interacting with? What topics interest them? Um, so I actually built a CRM for community that does all that, that will look at uh, the different platforms that I use and pull um, profile data about people and what they're saying. And it'll give me information about trends that are going on or who's my most active. Um, so for me, it's the observability tools that I use and my team uses to get that additional context and information about the people in my community. So that's the Savannah, right? Yeah, that's that's Savannah CRM. Um, and there's a few others now that are all doing the same uh, kind of community CRM approach. So what tools do you classify as CRM? Savannah, is it Orbit? Uh, Savannah, Orbit, um, Comsor, there's a few others. Uh, Jared just posted Common Room in the chat, uh, I think is one of them. And I know a lot of people, they use Google Sheets or they use Airtables to, uh, to try and do this, um, either manually updating it all or trying to wire things together to uh, pull that information in. But the, the key thing is just being able to have all the information that you can't gather yourself like you people don't scale um so you really need to automate as much of that as you can again not automating the engagement itself but automating the the collection and the analysis to present a, a condensed version of that information to community managers so that they can use that to make better decisions and how they engage with the community so i'm curious about the crm concept right because it's a relatively new thing Comster's been there for a while. Savannah the just started Orbit and Common Room are relatively new. So prior to that, people were running their communities with just these, like you said, Google Sheets and Airtable. Yeah, and a whole lot of just gut feelings. Like there was a lot of you, you built up your own experience and that made you good at it, but you had no way to share that experience with anybody else on your team, anybody new to the industry. Um, and so the, the community CRMs, they take the same approach as sales CRMs in that, you know, you don't want to contact a company to try and make a sale and know nothing about them or their history or their needs. You want as much of that information as you can get so that when you engage with them, you're engaging with them effectively and efficiently. Uh, and so the community CRMs, they do the same thing. They try and give you the context around who you're engaging with so that you can be better at that. So one more question about CRMs. Do they normally contain like a, a container for the community or do they just pick information from Slack and all this information, all this uh, platforms? I'm not quite sure what you mean by a container. So like if I use Savannah HQ, is there like a Slack function, a chat function or uh, like a groups function within Savannah? Uh, not usually, no. Um, they usually just pull in data from the other platforms that you're using. Okay, uh, so they don't try and provide the platform. Um, Salesforce has community cloud, which does. Um, but I think all the others, they don't try and provide a new platform for your community. They just try and work with the ones that you're already using. Okay. That's cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Andy? Oh, we have quite the stack. Uh, I dropped it into the chat here. Um, that uh, high level, the stuff that uh, I'm responsible for, uh, we have our blogs on WordPress. Uh, we have um, the forums powered by Koros. Uh, Bevy, a relatively new addition to the stack, powering all of our right now virtual events, but eventually when we have our chapter programs running, uh, we're using that. Uh, and Slack. We're using for some async chat with special groups who have access, usually folks under NDA, customer councils, that sort of thing, uh, and sprinkler for social. And then there's a whole bunch of other tools that we use for analytics, collaboration, project management, uh, 
it depends on who we're working with and what we're integrating with. But uh, yeah, that's what we're what we're running. I love it because you also showed what it's used for. That, that's yeah. quite a stack, Andy. How do you <laughs> make sure that uh, they're all working together? And not uh, just the other providing other... like. <laughs> the other part of the stack that I didn't mention was uh, Confluence. Um, there's a lot of documentation, uh, lots of documentation, lots of diagramming. Uh, community, um, for me at least, like, it was always a hobby. So separate career path for me coming into this from web development and doing uh, those sorts of projects. Uh, I've always looked at community as just being another take on that. Uh, when we actually get to the build part, when you're not looking at programming and the, the the people part, but you're looking at the platform and tech stack part, you're building a site. And it's all of the different components that would go into a fairly sophisticated site build. You're thinking about the same things when it comes to uh, the community tech stack. So that's helped. And I just look at the layers of what are the things that happen on the front end all the way to the back end? What are the things that are running uh, really behind the scenes um, for analytics and reporting. Uh, and it's getting even more complicated now with a lot of stuff around GDPR, privacy compliance. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that? Uh, so yeah, the, the stacks are getting quite big <laughs> when you get into enterprise. Comments? Jared, Natalie, Regina, Craig, and Smriti. <laughs> No comments per se outside of what I'm using or, you know, and I'm splitting it because I'm with a startup, but then I also organize my own independent community. I mean, some of the same ones, I'll touch the ones that have not been mentioned. Um, engineers, Reforge has been really good at just a lot of the stuff that we use. Our engineers are building it. Like people are like, oh, what's your form? And I'm like, we built it, um, but um, Metabase for the data, a lot of um, data is being fed into Metabase. Um, Notion, I don't think, I didn't hear that being mentioned. We're migrating our email to Iterable. Um, we've done some discussions on Clubhouse. Asana <laughs> is being used from, for project management and we actually now, um, have the Reforge member community on Slack. Um, and then there's other stuff that I didn't mention that. Um, let's see that um, Michael, Andy, and oh, we lost someone, whoever the, 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 the lady was at the start, it looks like she might've dropped off. Um, and then for my um, meetup, meetup itself, I did meetup, the meetup platform, SEO on meetup can't be beat y'all, I'm sorry. Really? Um, Eventbrite, um, Tucon, I'm experimenting with some. So some of these, Tucon, Run the World, um, or I'm experimenting with, Substack for the email that I send out, and also Upstream is another one that I've used before. My goodness. I saw a demo of Tucan uh, a little while ago, and that's a really interesting platform. Like, I, I really it want looks, the opportunity to yeah, try it, that out. Yeah, it looks good. I think my next networking meetup, I'm just going to try it because I, I told everybody, I'm like, I'm experimenting. It's summertime. It's hiatus. Now's the time for me to break things. It looks like it's something that can give you that uh, what we call the hallway track experience where people just gather together in between sessions to you know, chat about the things they share in common. Um, and that really seems to facilitate that. So that's why I'm excited about giving that a try. Fantastic. Natalie? So, yeah. Go ahead, Greg, um, sorry. No, Natalie, go ahead, that's fine. No, you go, Craig, I talked a lot in the beginning, so it's- And I missed that. Oh, <laughs> uh, so I'm new, I'm, I'm in the process of uh, forming a community now, but I've uh, migrated uh, a, a free plan for Mighty Networks to start up on Circle. Um, I use Notion for just about everything. I max it out. I've taken everything from Confluence and uh, Asana and put it on, uh, 
uh, notion. And I'm actually, I'm thinking about looking at ways that we can use it on the back end for some of our knowledge management and content management uh, tied to uh, circles well. And then I just signed up with Outseta uh, based on one of the uh, conference calls but uh, I haven't used it yet, so I just have a consultant right now that's advising me on setting up some of the some of the back end behind the scenes stuff on the community. So what was that knew, tool called? I'm sorry. What was that tool called? That last one you mentioned? Outsetta. O U T S A or O U T S E T A. Let me look it up. Yeah, O U T S E T A. So, Craig, what kind of community are you building, and why did you move from Mighty Networks to Circle? Got it. Uh, yeah, so the uh, community is uh, a former chief communication officers, retired chief communication officers, who um, uh, I think the big challenge for them is that uh, they would rather be unemployed than be bored. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so it's a lot of uh, career counseling, rebranding, and uh, and uh, woe is me, commiserating, and uh, basically. Uh, so as far as myself, I'm a former full time professor, and I've just taken my area of research and flipped it into helping this particular community, and uh, just a lot of the things that I discovered in terms of being one person working with corporate, it was just a heck of a lot of learning. So. I've discovered that uh, it's a set of uh, uh, skills and uh, resources that they don't have, and they're really good at helping other people and not so good at helping themselves. And, and why did you move to the network to Circle? Uh, so, uh, one, I think we expanded too large because it's the, the Global Forbes 2000, and I've managed to get a few pretty big interesting people that i felt like were going to be more magnets for others so uh number well so one is it's to attract a better audience instead of just kind of scatter uh, scattershot approach uh and then the second is to convert it from a free plan to a a, a pay plan and it turns out that we're not so excited about having community on their mobile phones surprisingly yeah really? yeah yeah one one limitation of mighty networks was that uh i mean right now we're not facing it with covid but pre-covid uh one of the features of mighty networks is that when you're traveling to another part of the world and you you know you turn on the community you can immediately see who's logged in within you know an hour and a half radius or nearby and that turns out to be a feature that none of them want. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> you can't turn it off, huh? You can't turn it off. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of using Mighty. Cool. Jared, any input or comments so far? Yeah, I was just thinking having unless you like the anonymity, having the, um, there was that movie, The Circle, like having the, having a complete, you know, true you basically across all platforms so that, you know, I guess if you're personal versus business, but, you know, you could be scattered everywhere. It'd be nice to have one location for all your, who you are, unless you want to be anonymous, I guess. Um, the other the other angle to that that i saw uh i just joined discord for a dow community doing crazy stuff and one of the things they said there is that having a different persona allows you to be uh, in that space allows you to be a truer version of yourself in that space because you're different at work and at home so it's kind of like different platforms not to hide but just to i guess make that part of you flourish I think everybody has different uh, different voices. You've got your professional voice, and you've got your like friends and family voice, and they're not they're they're both you, but they're there for different purposes, and so they come across different. 
So I, I have a question because it looks like I'm very excited about the tools. I know that Michael and Andy have a software development background, so their stacks are amazing. But for <laughs> for those of us who are just in the middle, like for me, I always think about the people and the processes version first, and then I have a problem and think and start thinking that this there has to be a way to solve this problem, not just from the human side, but from the tool side, right? But trying to find out where that tool is, is kind of hard if you are just on your own. So it's the importance of showing up to events like this, because then I know, oh, that's the way you fix it, or that's the way you make it work, right? Yeah, I think I sharing our knowledge and experience with stack building and getting everything to work together, um, you know, that's an important contribution we can all make to our industry. And uh, things like this, uh, um, where we can all come in and we can talk and, you know, we all learn about new tools today and we all learn about different ways people are using them together uh, to achieve the same goal. It gives us all more information than we had uh, before we joined here. I'd like to know Which about part of the benefit yeah. is just hearing about tools that you had no idea even existed and then also hearing about new ways of using a tool maybe you already used, but you had no idea it could do that, right? Um, so I, I just posted one called OCR Auditorium uh, online. This is one, it's actually Remo, if you've heard of Remo. Uh, it's been around for a couple of years. It's an alternative to Zoom and where it really excels is emergent discussion. So it, it actually uses a metaphor of an auditorium where you see tables and with their pictures of their LinkedIn profiles sitting around. And the, the nice thing about it is that you can come into a room and you see all the faces there and then you just double click on the table and then you're immediately on a breakout, a small group discussion with that group of people. And if you want to change, double click on another table. Uh, it's been around for a couple of years, but uh, I got in early on it when they were first uh, coming out. And I found that it was great for uh, high school kids and, you know, uh, I can't even, what's well, not Gen X anymore, Gen Y, Gen Z, Gen AA. Uh, but the CEO is like 26, 27 years old, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, wannabe. And it was just, I, I found the platform just a little too childish for, for, uh, for adults. And uh, so I managed to provide enough feedback that uh, they let me carve out a, a version of it for corporate. And so that's, that's how I came up with a, a rebranded name there so that I could do something for my audience there. And now it's like a room that just kind of sits there. So, um, but we, I've had McDonald's, Microsoft, uh, Johnson and Johnson, PayPal, in there and they love it so much more than zoom because it's a little bit more engaging um one question i have for for for, for people here some people mentioned common room um uh, i would like to know how that's different than outset or if they're two completely different things or for starting a uh community if common room is something i should jump in on right away So I'm not really familiar with Outseta, so I can't really give a comparison. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, Outseta was recommended from uh, somebody in the Circle community. So it's a community on Circle for Circle community managers, and they uh, 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 one of the workshops there. They, I, I was just impressed with the degree of automation of handling some of the back end stuff that I've tried to take care of on my own that is just really uh, time consuming, right? Just some of the automated emails of when they join or resetting the password or getting them acclimated and telling them where to go. And uh, that's about all that I know. Uh, I start with so I, I do some work with Common Room, but not to use the um, their app. So they're just announcing their community. It's on Common Room. Um, okay. it, it, it functions just like a CRM, Michael, as far as I know. I saw a quick demo and it doesn't, it just takes whatever tools you have now 
and pulls out data from there. But it looked really exciting. I know that uh, Confluence Confluent uses it, and I think Figma uses it. I'm not sure. Yeah, but they're they're starting to announce it, and um, it's good people behind it. I'm biased. Sorry. <laughs> common room or uncommon room? Common room is the name of the company. Their community okay. is called Uncommon Room. I know. What is that? Dot com or? Room dot io. Got it. Okay. There you go. Cool. Thank you. But a question for all of you: um, in in the UK, the COVID restrictions are um, so soon we'll be able to host in person events and. When I was hosting some top users calls, uh, people were telling me that they don't want another channel to build community online. They want to meet. Are you also facing this problem that people are just not engaging online anymore? Done with it? We have seen a decline. So we had a an in-person conference that happened every six months. Uh, and then when COVID hit, we switched that to a virtual one. And we saw um, really high attendance the first time, and it just kind of dropped each uh, each online event after that. And I have heard from a lot of people who are feeling this online conference fatigue uh, because it's, it's a lot harder to justify spending time um, you know, sitting at home watching videos on your computer than it was when you, you know, flew to a different location and that was all you had to do. So I do think there's quite a bit of people just, they're tired of um, Zoom events. They want to go hang out with people in person and be able to you know, talk in the hallway or go out to dinner after the event or all the other things that we miss out on uh, being stuck at home. Yeah, that's that uh, definitely resonates with what we're seeing. Uh, whether you're doing something on Bevy in a, in a virtual meetup like this, or you're on Zoom or Teams or whatever else, like it's a bunch of heads on the screen. Uh, a, a video call is a video call. Uh, it's not going to replace that experience of being in person. Um, in terms of the shift from virtual to in person, I'm noticing it really depends on the geography of the individuals. Uh, so for, like for myself, I'm based outside of Toronto in Canada. The the, the feeling here is very different from my colleagues who are in Florida, and that's very different from my colleagues who are in the Midwest in the US. So it, it seems to vary depending on what your local situation is and what the context is. Um, and I think we're going to be in that sort of nebulous sp um, changing situation, depending on the size of your community. Do you have groups that are in certain regions that are uh, more open to getting together in person versus ones that aren't. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, it's also summertime. And so with um, SF Tech for Good, I always take a hiatus in the summertime. So just seasonally, <laughs> this is a low season, but yes, I'm sure um, other issues around the pandemic are converging um, to to impact attendance. And yeah, I agree with Andy. Um, like I, uh, on both communities, in-person is a no-go right now, um, just because I, I don't want to be part of um, a super, a possible super spreader event. Granted, a lot where I am, California, high vaccination rates. So, um, but you know, still the risk is there for people who, for whatever reason, they can't get vaccinated and things like that. And that's a different issue altogether. And then, of course, on a company level, same issue. We don't want to possibly um, have an event and have it be something where it's a spreader event because the Delta variant is out there and having fun along with all the events that are happening. <laughs> Now, somebody in uh, one of the other slacks I'm a part of um, asked if everybody was seeing that summer slump happening early this year. And I went back and looked at some of my stats. And yeah, it did look like um, you know, it started like in March, April that the slump started um, instead of like June, July. So I think maybe that 
that plays into, you know, we're all just tired from the pandemic already um, and, and taking that slump a little bit early, but it does seem to be kind of across the industry that that's happening. I'm not sure I'm looking forward to going to the office. I've been, I guess, remote for years. I mean, I, I to go out, I'd rather go on vacation because like I've been on vacation for a few days. Oh my God, it's amazing. It's liberating that, you know, I, I see a different sofa now instead of mine <laughs> <laughs> and, live, and live in someone else's bed. But I am, I'm such a geek, you guys, and I love that we have this community stacks. And I love what Andy wrote where he wrote the software and what he's using it for. So I'm thinking doing a survey like this so that we can all figure out what people are using. Because in my mind, like this is a start just to figure out who's using what. But then in the end, I imagine that we could come up with like an article or, or post somewhere where it says, if you have a problem with this, these are some of the tools that you can use, right? Am I making sense? Yeah, uh, I believe there already are lists like this. Um, mm -hmm. I know I've seen people trying to collect this data in more than one place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Comsor does it, um, although people are starting to complain about how big that list is. And yeah. um, I was bugging David because back in the day, CMX did it, and he said that they're going to come out with one um, soon. So they're coming back around on it, but they didn't do it for a while. I'm also curious the tools that people use for the different types of community, right? Because a developer community is different than a marketing officer's community kind of thing. Or is it essentially the same? No, I think it's going to be different. Like things like discourse and Slack are really heavily used in the tech communities. But you know, if you're in a social community or like a, a local political organization, that's not necessarily the tools that uh, the people in your community are going to be familiar with. Um, and as I really love to say, you need to go where your community is. The yeah. best tool to use is the one that they're already using. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Like uh, when I look at the conversations happening in like the CMX Slack Community Club um, about platforms, you see a lot of the familiar names come up. Uh, I haven't seen anyone mention Nation Builder once, and that's such a a big platform for nonprofits and fundraising, political organizations. Uh, the, the, the scope of community and community platforms and the, that stack and the tools that you use is so broad that uh, it's really hard to, you, you can't be really comprehensive about it because it means so many things to different people uh, and the types of people that you're getting together and, and why do they want to get together to what end, um, whether they want to be anonymous or not. Uh, mm -hmm tech level, uh, tech comfort level. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the same applies for health. I'm a type one diabetic. We are out there, but you will find most of us. Um, there's even still like a, a weekly Twitter chat. I'm amazed. I, I don't take part anymore, but you know, there's a form which was developed by some diabetics. Um, and, and, but most of us, from what I can see, we're in Facebook. There are just tons and tons and tons of like Facebook groups um, about it, but I don't see the diabetic, the type one diabetic community in in places like Discord or Slack. Mm -hmm. They're just not there. I think the age range. There's just so many of us, there's kids to to people who are you know who are geriatric and just the knowledge range. I, I'm not gonna try to guide my older type ones into a Slack or Discord conversation. It's hard enough to get them into a Zoom call with a <laughs> password. I'm not doing it. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, I mean, great, and there are tons of lists out there, but I think there's just so many different tools. It gets really difficult, like, searching through a whole list, and, and then you don't really get enough information just from a list. I think there's a huge power in 
in having people who are using the tools who can talk about exactly what they're for. So I don't know if anybody has a, a problem or a challenge or something that like, I really wish I had a tool that would do this. And, and then maybe as a group, we can see if we know of anything. Does anybody have anything like that? No, but I like that approach. Like it, if you center it on a challenge, like my challenge is this, it's not that I need a chat platform. It's that I need a chat platform that works for people who are retired and spread around the world. Well, that's got a different set of challenges than people who are in college. Um, so maybe maybe if you focused it on that, because that it would be a little bit more helpful. Know, right? What? You don't know what you don't know. Yeah, and oftentimes finding out what the right question to ask is, is the hardest part. Like once you can get the question right, then the answer becomes obvious. But knowing what what it is you actually want to answer uh, is a lot of times the hardest thing. So, so I love this thing that I learned from the design thinking thing process, where it's like, what are your, I always ask people, what are your top three challenges right now? Just in general, because the personal could be business, you just don't know it. Like I can't sleep, well, why? Because I can't manage my community or something like that. So that's usually where I like to go. Uh, another approach similar to that, um, I stole this from a, an old boss, is starting off with uh, asking what success looks like. Like if everything goes well, what's what's the actual outcome here? What's that experience like? Uh, going to that, to, to Michael's point about the chat, like, well, okay, well maybe, the outcome isn't necessarily chat. It's all well, we want to connect these people to each other. Well, what's mm -hmm. the best way to do that? Is it chat or is it something else? Is it real time chat? Maybe if it is chat, is it real time chat or is it like asynchronous um, posting messages somewhere? Lots of ways to slice it. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was thinking that it's a component, rather if you can emulate the real world, like what it would be like if you were really there, like with um, like having the tables and and the, and a like a speaker platform and stuff, or having kind of like the smart option to where you can see similarities so that you you can like kind of formulate that question beforehand because you can kind of see interests or paths and you kind of know where to connect besides just, you know, there's people in the room or somebody's name, like there's more context between um, beforehand. Right now, one challenge I'm having is I'm, I'm in terms of bringing everyone in, it's one on one, and I would love to just announce and have everyone just join, right? One day, with a big splash instead of kind of, uh, you know, dripping them in one at a time. So any thoughts on that? I've got a list of about 400 around the world and I've got about 70 from uh, Mighty Networks and I've got uh, 10 that have committed to being founding members to help, you know, provide a year of uh, startup costs. But uh, it's, uh, Everyone else is very much well. Is Sam joining? Is John there yet? Or Sally there yet? Or who else is there? And I'd rather, you know, I, I guess the answer is a marketing campaign. And strangely enough, that's not my thing. So onboarding is very much a community responsibility. Like it should not yeah. be just one person who's responsible for onboarding everything new. Um, part of the community manager's job is making sure that everyone else in the community has the resources and the information and the, um, the the motivation and the encouragement to take that up. And when somebody new joins or wants to join, that they can help them get on board and get running and start making those first few connections in the community that they need to really stick around. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I know that 
or um, SF Tech for Good, whenever I write a newsletter, I simply say, if you know anyone who's interested in the subject or wants to be part of this community, feel free to forward it every single time I get new people joining, you know, because I, I ask, I ask some intake questions. How did you hear about it? And right after a newsletter, I'll always hear people say, or, you know, read it, people will say newsletter, right? Um, the same thing on Clubhouse, because I was one of the test flighters on Clubhouse. Um, it's gone now, but um, within the test flighter stage of Clubhouse, you had to onboard the people you invited. Um, you had to bring them into room. Welcome. You don't really see them that much on Clubhouse anymore, um, which is unfortunately. But that's why, the, because also yeah. having a, a level of familiarity, yeah, onboarding with the app, with the community, how it works, the norms, the core values, et cetera, et cetera, is really important. Or else you just feel lost. Thank you. Which a lot of people do on Clubhouse now. Yeah, I delete it on Clubhouse. <laughs> Craig, what kind of service are you trying to give to your community? Is it events or talks or one-on-ones? Uh, events, uh, uh, events, talks, one-on-one, tech stack support, uh, masterminds, a little have bit of all. Started, right? Have you I'm started sorry? offering? Have you started offering those services? Uh, no, I'm 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 developing like the talks right now and inviting the guests and you know developing the programs for a launch here in the next ninety days. Okay, because the way I built my community, I just started doing events, and I, I didn't have a lot of people at first. Like this is what I want to do. I started doing events. They heard about it. They told everyone, and they just came. And usually, Correct. the first couple of events is like we're forming a group. What do we want to know? Here are some of the things I want to do. What do you want to do? Kind of got stuff. it so but these were live events or i mean in-person events or okay uh did you have a theme or a talk as, as a part of your program? yeah it was a, a, a tech talks a tch talks it's like i just landed in my hometown after working abroad and i said i want to know what's going on here i can talk yeah. about google apps and let's i'll buy you coffee there's always yeah. the free drink and free snack for me yeah so uh, what I have worked out is a talk on uh, Iggy Kai. Is that, what, is that how you say it? The Japanese philosophy, and then um, another on, you know, starting a business, the tech stack, or some of the initial things of like working with Google Drive or hiring an intern or figuring out what your business model is, and you know, they have some very basic questions that uh, you know that they need for for getting started on top of just seeing everyone and just not having an agenda just you know banter for 45 minutes to an hour I've, I've always worked with interns in the last few years and it works for me andy and trying to be not <laughs> to, to be in step with what's new because i have no idea i can't keep up with it. Can I bring another? Yes. Um, I have to engage a finance audience. So basically, my the business is um, we want to democratize investing and we want to democratize uh, impact investing. So you only invest in companies that are actually doing something good in the world. They cannot be neutral. And you can start investing with as little as five pounds. So that's a great start, right? We grew from a thousand customers to a hundred thousand customers in two years, and that's great. Um, but now we are suffering a couple of things. We need to increase referrals, reduce churn, and uh, increase our customers' lifetime. Hi. So those are those are my challenges at the moment um, and just giving some contest some context behind it um, we are not able to engage our customers online they don't want to talk they don't want to join a forum a chat or anything like that i'm trying to do events as well um, we literally had events with one thing um, now we are trying to be a little bit more aggressive 
to um, host an event that is a, it's a little bit more um, challenging. So it challenges your mind. So the topic is investing without the BS. So hopefully we can get more attendance for this one. Uh, but yeah, those are the three main challenges. Referrals, stop churn, and increase our customer's lifetime with us. Are your customers the people investing or the companies being invested in? Uh, the people investing their money in the companies, yeah. Okay. You tapped into the, um, I mean, I lead one of them. Have you tapped oh. in the into well no into the tech for good communities we're huge i i'm in the us so i don't think that you know the the group that i lead would be relevant you mentioned you know being yeah. on the other side of the atlantic but the london tech for good meetup is massive it's insane um how big they are i'm kind of jealous actually cuz i thought i had the largest group <laughs> And when I found out they were larger, I was like, no, but, you know, but there are other, um, there are other groups, but not only in the UK, but in other areas of the EU, that might be a good network to tap into, um, as well as, although I think N10 has retired their, um, their community groups, but they're always those people, sorry, got distracted by Slack. Because, sorry, <laughs> all right. So I think connections are the most important part of a community. Those, they're the glue that holds it all together. They're the key to making sure that people stick around and keep coming back. And you said that your community doesn't want to connect over the forums, uh, which seems... Virtually, they don't want to connect. Oh, virtually. Well, they want to talk about something, how they would like to connect. So they're like, friends. and I'm like, yeah, but there's COVID out there. And they're like, yeah, but when we can, that's when we will um, engage. So I'm like, okay, so we need to wait. <laughs> I think uh, maybe something like newsletter, you know, Regina said that her newsletter gets a lot of people forwarding it and sharing it, maybe, you know, providing regular updates of, you know, where the investments have gone, what good they've done, um, let people share their stories. You know, maybe reach out to your customers and just get a short story that you can include in each of your newsletters about you know, why they invested and you know, where their investment's gone and what it's done um, so that people still get to know each other that way um, as something to keep them involved and start building those connections until you can start doing in-person events again. Yeah, I yeah, think, I that's, think that, that's a great idea. Um, yeah. I would also say, like, if people aren't connecting online and they aren't coming to the events, it's probably because they don't think that there is going to provide what they're looking for, right? The value that they're looking for. So you probably need to understand what it is that they're looking for. So if we're talking about tools, I would look at a survey tool. Um, like I use SurveyMonkey, but I know there's a bunch out there and see if you can get them to fill out a survey so you can really understand what is it they would want from those events or from connecting with other people. Is it, um, is it to feel good about where their money's going? Is it to learn about new investment opportunities? Um, I don't know, whatever it is, but really trying to drill down into into how what kind of value they're looking for. And when you do a survey, I would recommend that you ask them about their challenges and not the solutions that they want, um, because they're much more familiar with what they don't like than they are with how to fix it. Th those are all great suggestions great ideas yeah i was going to say that also um, i use uh, miko which is like an email and substack reader because i get like 300 um, every other day or so and it's just readable than an email client so as far as reach out it's probably like a substack or a newsletter of sorts if you're not in person, because it's like you can, because you can include video or audio or pictures, you can like some somewhat make it real to them. So they feel like they're coming along for the ride. 
Can you pop the link in the chat, please? Sure. That's great. Natalie, are you still continuing to have one-on-one -on -one discussions with your super clans or like? I am. And I would never stop doing that. That's my, that's the, um, that's just my, my gas to keep going. You know, <laughs> when things are not going well, when I talk to those yeah. people and they're completely in love with the brand, I'm like, okay, we are going the right direction. <laughs> I, I usually you, like to ask my community before I'm like, which speaker or what topic do you are you curious about? And I always say, if you were a king or queen for the day and money was no object, who would you want, you know, to be a speaker or hear from? Because I would reach out to those people, <laughs> and it has worked for me. I was able to get you know one or the two local celebrities, and and I'm like, hey, you asked for it, I got it, so now you got to show up. <laughs> Hey. Yeah. Natalie, do you have leadership opportunities for your community members to actually make decisions and drive programs? Um, we so I just started two months ago. Um, so I'm still building and implementing the strategy and seeing what works and what doesn't work. But ideally, we will have a, a tier program where we will have different um, responsibilities within the community. And then people can actually go do community-led projects, community-led events, but we are not there yet. The community is too apart right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have found that is a good motivator when people, uh, especially people who are new to the community or just kind of uh, passively there, see other community members who are you know, moving up into leadership positions or you know, pos positions of authority where they can have a, a bigger impact that that motivates them to want to be part of that also. Um, so they'll get more involved and they'll work their way up to that also. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely reach out. I think only, only two people actually got back um, during the interviews and said, yeah, if you want to do something, I would love to get started and have community-led events. So two people offered for free. <laughs> I didn't mm -hmm. ask. So I think there is a huge potential to explore in there. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, guys. Um are there a lot of successes in the investments that have been made, Natalie? Or is it we, relatively new? What do you mean? Like in the investments that people have made, obviously there are success stories, right? Um, like people who are able to withdraw the money and buy their houses. Is that what you mean? <laughs> or what? Like people are actually making money. Uh, just in general, like what are the success stories when people make an investment with your impact investment group, right? Because I would think if I was an impact investor, I want to know about the good stuff that happened based on my investments. Okay, yeah. So we are also building this. We're building an impact report so people know like what is the effects of their money through the companies that they are investing in. So we have a carbon offsetting plan as well um that we will be able to show to people how much uh and what it means right uh how much carbon they offset and um what it actually means in real life like how many phones you can charge how many houses you can keep with the lights on for a year um so we are working on this but it will take some time because it needs to be built in app um we are now starting to tell stories through email about the companies that people are investing in. And today I got three stories from customers, like those people who were able to draw their money, buy their house, and now they are investing again. So yeah, so we, we will be able to tell those stories soon. Soon. About that one story right away. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will, okay, well, we will tell them. I think I think that's that's possibly one of the reasons why people are not seeing themselves, right? They are not they're not represented because they are not seeing other people. Maybe that's why they don't want to engage. 
Yeah. Anyhow, um, we're, I think, close to time. Yeah. If you don't mind, I want to take just a quick photo just so I have a souvenir of us. I don't, I usually won't publish this online. Is that okay? I take a quick a screenshot. Sure. Yeah. Smile, everybody. Okay. Um, I want to say something about some personal projects of mine, and then I'm going to invite Claire to, to close the session. So I love building communities. I ran a nonprofit promoting tech startups and design based on communities, women's health communities. And this last month, after applying for lots of jobs, I decided I'm just going to do stuff on my own. So I do um, side projects. I am doing a side research project for Common Room, but the space where I want to build on the next few months is I want to help more people learn about community. And do you know that there are 15 online schools for community management? That's the research I was doing. It's insane. All of us learn from scratch, but there are 15 courses now starting. There were like eight last year. So I want to be in that space and um, not to build my own co uh, course, but to make it easy for people to find those courses and have like group studies and mentorship and eventually have certified community managers like an industry standard. That's the thing that I kept talking about for the last year. But if you're interested to know what I'm doing, just reach out. And if I can help you in any way, reach out as well. Clear. That sounds oh. great, Tina. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great project and uh, and and happy to help with it. And I think it'll uh, be great to have for the industry. Um, all right, so you said you want, wanted me to close out, so I will close out. Um, thank you, everyone. Andre, you just got in. We're yeah. about to <laughs> oh, I have it on my calendar as, it as it's starting at 12 Central. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, feel free to re reach out to any one of us. I'm <laughs> recording this and we'll share it with you. But if you have specific questions, you can put it on the chat. Okay, I'll reach out to you, Tina. Thanks so much. Okay. All right. Happy to be here. <laughs> Good to see you just for yeah. a minute, anyway. All right. Um, Bye. Yeah, and thanks for everybody for coming, answering all the questions. Another great discussion and great to see you all. Hope to see you next month, too. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See ya. Bye. Take care. Bye.